To celebrate publishing over 100 episodes of the Fishing the DMV podcast and surpassing 2,000 subscribers on YouTube, I am giving away a free guided fishing trip with Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Fishing Guide Services. The giveaway will run through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th, and I'm going to give you three unique opportunities to win the fishing trip. Number one, the number one way that you can enter the competition is by leaving a review of the show at Apple Podcasts. After the review at the very bottom, comment hashtag fishing the DMV and you're automatically entered in the sweepstakes. Number two, commenting on every video that I drop from Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. And then at the end of your comment, leave hashtag fishing the DMV. And then you're again entered to win the competition. Number three, the final way that you can enter a chance to win is by ordering online from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Every online order through them automatically enters you with a chance to win as long as you leave the hashtag fishing the DMV. The contest again runs through Wednesday, April 5th through Saturday, May 6th. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. I don't understand like what is with you North Carolina guys and being so goddamn versatile. Like watching Lake Murray and seeing like Patrick Walters, again, I know he's like from where he's at, but there's so many Carolina boys that you guys just freaking, is it cause this is just the diversity? of blueback and tidal and then grass, everything you have? Well, yeah, I think it's a variety of all the different types of cover we have the fish and bait fish. But dude, if you're surrounding the Lake Norman area, you, it, dude, it just grows them around here. Like you, I can sit here and count on every finger on both my hands of either Elite Series Pro or, or just classic champion forest would cut dude, it's just insane the amount of talent that grows around this area dude it's insane it it, it, it is and it's just every time you see like a, a Kerr event or a smith mountain lake event or like a james there's always a ton of carolina anglers in the top of it and it's just it has to be that you have the diversity that you have and there's so many fisheries because like when i fished college and we would go to like when we went to the national championship and you go down to where was it? it was i think it was like lake murray actually and you're talking from guys from alabama and everything and they're like well where do you fish and you tell them how much we have to travel and they're like holy shit we have to drive five minutes for every tournament we're in like and this is the same thing with the carolinas you guys have so many lakes so close whereas me in northern virginia you know i have to put a mortgage payment to fill my tank to get to smith <laughs> to get to the james everywhere it's insane yeah, dude, and that's one thing about growing up around this area outside of Charlotte, dude. There's a lot of lakes close. I'm, I could be at the boat ramp at Lake Wiley in 15 minutes. I could be at Lake Norman in about 25. Um, I could be at Lake Murray in two hours. Um, High Rock in an hour. Wow. Um, I could go to Hartwell. I could be there in two hours, two hours, 15 minutes. You start talking Lanier, you're talking more about three, but dude, just the amount of lakes that's around this area within a five hour distance, it's uh, tournament lakes too, man. They're not just mm -hmm. random lakes. They're all the tournaments go there. They're liable. I mean, you look at this year, you had the Bass Pro Tour and the elites on Lake Murray. I mean, that's two hours from the house. I mean, and that's, what's correct. I think, I think the FL old FLW, they had their college championship. I think it was 2015 or 16. I was there and there wasn't a lot of grass at Lake Murray. And at least from what the elites guys were saying, like it sounds like the grass is back at Murray, which is freaking awesome, man. If that's the case. Yeah, it's there too. And I think a lot of it's just growing on the bottom more sore than just, just go in the pockets and it's just everywhere you can flip the grass. It, it's, it's there, but it's not like, you know, Thick, you know, thick, uh, overgrown, but it's that you know how it is around here. I don't know how much you know about these areas, but Duke Power and uh, the other they they manage that stuff very well. The homeowners they don't like grass going around their dogs. So in Virginia, we had this issue with with vegetation spraying, and it's bad. And like you look at Smith Mountain Lake and like Gaston, places like that that just get saturated with with pesticides, and it sucks because if you put grass or hydrilla in Smith Mountain Lake, holy shit. Like that place would be banging, and it, it to see that Murray might get some more grass in it. Like that place would, is only going to get better. That's what's so insane, dude. I don't think Smith Mountain really needs to improve. I, think, I don't see how it can improve. It's it's rocking and rolling, dude. That place is gone. 
Oh, oh my God. I don't know how, what, what devil contract was put to where the bass opens went to Kerr. Because again, I, I, you know, I think, I don't know if you saw my other episodes, but I had the winner on from, I think it was the Piedmont division at, um, at Kerr Bryson. And he thinks the weights are going to be pretty low when the bass opens go there. And I really think if you put that tournament on Smith in April, it would really show out way better than Kerr ever could. Yeah. So dude, the, the whole strategy that goes into the opens, it's, it's really factored in to a 200 boat field. And it's completely different than like a hundred, 150 boats show up. These guys show up and they practice and they're catching them, you know, throughout practice. And by the time the tournament starts, that plays a big effect on the weights. And a lot of people don't, don't factor that into the equation because that is a big deal. It really is. Cause you got to think about it this way. How many guys will go in this one area, get a bite or two, swim one off, leave. Next guy comes in. It's a repeating cycle all over the whole lake. By the time day one of the tournament starts, it, it's going to be good, but yeah. you got to think about it too, though. It, they the pressure, pressure has changed fishing in the last five to ten years. It really has. And that's the sad thing where I think Major League Fishing had something there where you'd split the field and you could go to some of these little sneaky lakes like around North Carolina that I never even heard of those damn places until Major League Fishing went there. And because it does, it gets fun when you see all these different lakes. I mean, even I think it was they went to Table Rock finally. And yeah. I agree out it. That wasn't the big dogs, but I haven't seen I haven't seen Clark's Hill. It was Clark's Hill. Yeah, I'm sorry. But yeah. I haven't seen Clark's Hill on the schedule in forever. It was so cool to see that place back. Yeah, and I think you were talking uh, about the selects, the MLF of selects, when they went to the Atkins yeah. team. They fished Tillery, Baden. Um, what's the other one? Uh, Tuckertown. I, I don't know if they went to Tuckertown, but I do. All three of them lakes were phenomenal. They, they're really fun lakes to fish. They got the, uh, I guess they call it gator grass, shore grass on the banks. They they leave it alone. It grows really good in the summertime and the spring, and then like. Early pre-spawn, it's dead, so you can actually it mats up, and you can actually flip mats on those places. So oh that's wow! Cool. Yeah, you ain't even got to drive to Florida to flip mats. <laughs> and that's the one thing that I'm so jealous of you guys is you have so many fishing opportunities. And we're talking about this a little bit before we started recording, and and really just for the audience at home to kind of gear up and kind of to weave this tale of you winning at Smith. Cause we're going to get there. Like what got you into fishing and kind of tell about your story because this wasn't your first tournament you fished. Uh, uh, Cole has won a ton of money over on FLW MLF side. And he's also fished a bunch of bass opens. He finished third at Lake Norman um, on the Bassmaster open side of things. So yeah, just the floor is yours, sir. So um, I started out fishing. My dad uh, actually owns a uh, tackle business and, uh, he kind of got me into fishing. He actually paid my entry fee as a co-angler in my first BFL. And I was fortunate enough to draw a guy named Tater Hog who owns Tater Hog Custom Lures. I don't know if you've ever heard of his giant swim baits and stuff, but I got paired with him and uh, I actually got a check and dude, that sparked the fire. So being around my dad's tackle business, meeting a lot of the local pros around this area, they kind of had some pushing on my shoulder and, it really got me into fishing and dude, I've been ate up with it since high school. Like I think my sophomore year, 10th grade, I was ate up doing tournaments. I, I wasn't even worried about going to college. I just wanted to get a boat and a truck and go fishing. So that, that's kind of my start, man. I, I was ate up with it as soon as I could drive. I wanted to fish. When did you get your first boat? I think I got it. I think it was my tenth grade year. It was a seventeen foot javelin, and dude, it was a it was a it was a beater. It was a beater boat. Me and my dad had to do some work to it, but it got me on the water and it got me fishing. And I slowly, I worked and progressed and steps, you know, stepping stone my way up. Now I'm in a new ZXR twenty skeeter. So it just, you know, the process didn't jump mm. any steps. I slowly. I had to work for everything so that I appreciate it. You know, that makes you appreciate it when you have to work for it. So. Oh, no. And, and with the boat prices, the way they are, there is no shame, you know, to have a boat, a used boat like that, because it, it is hard, uh, especially with the economy, the way it is now. And guess what? The live wheels still work the same. They still both hold 20 pounds. Mine's not a 2023. It's a 2021, but it's still pretty new to me. It's still got warranty. So. <laughs> oh, that's still, oh man, that's still, that's like brand new. <laughs> so yeah. when, what, what got you thinking about the opens then? Like, wh when did that whole process mentally start of like, I, when did you say to yourself you were ready for the next step? Um, so I've been doing it a while. 
and uh, I, having friends with some uh, Elite Series pros, you know, they kind of pushed me and said I was good enough to, you need to go over and fish the division of the Opens. And I tried it, and I had some success. You know, I had a bad tournament my first year at the Harris Chain, but Douglas and uh, Norman, you know, finishing third in that one, having a live camera on FS1, you know, showing me that, you know, I could really do it. It's actually all aired on YouTube, so you wanted to go watch it. I was actually blasting them on a buzz bait during the middle of the day, so it was pretty cool. Um, and that that's kind of, you know, that got me moving, you know, you know, stepping back, you know, I fished BFLs a while before that, team tournaments, you know. You know, didn't jump any steps. I felt like I was ready, you know. High 20s, doing it a while. So, uh, I felt like I was ready. You said that Lake Norman tournament, and I, it would it would be it would be a shame if we didn't actually talk about that because and I want to make sure I get this correct. Was that your second bass? That was the second bass open of the year, right? Was that the third that you did? It was the third. It was the third. So your 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 third ever crack at the apple, third place. Holy shit! Like yes, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, there, there's a story about that year. It it almost ended in an elite qualification, and then I don't know what I would have done. So the first tournament was on the Harris chain. My gear case went out soon as I got down there. And dude, I didn't get a boat until like I had not even a full day of practice. And I had nine lakes. First time to Florida. And if you've never fished in Florida, you know, or if you have, you know how fragile it is. It's overwhelming. There's so much cover. You have to fish slow sometimes in cold fronts. And I didn't get it, man. It just spun me out. First open, Greg Hackney, Patrick Walters, all these guys. And I'm like, dude, that, I, I'm in a loner boat. And it, it was just a wreck, you know. And then uh, the second one, we got back in my boat. And then I finished 25th on Douglas. And then the final one was on Lake Norman. And I finished third. And I think I ended up, I can't remember, 30th or something in the points, maybe 40th. And I, I looked at it, dude. If I'd have finished in like the top seventy or eighty, I'd have been in the top three in points. That just, you know, having a twenty fifth and a third. If I'd have just had a good running boat for some practice on the Harris chain, probably would have made the elites. But not saying I would have went, but probably would have went. But <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard. I've heard two, and again, like you know, if you Bass Talk Live, they've talked about this in the past. Agnosium. It's like if you crack it your first time. Do you take it or do you wait until you get more time and reps under your belt? Because I've heard both both variations of that. It's like, well, if you made it once, you can make it again. Wait till you got your finances and your sponsorships right. Or do you just take it immediately? But like, I don't know. If it was me and it was my first go at it, I would be nervous. Like, did I just hit three home runs randomly? <laughs> Am I actually yeah. ready for this step? So, and this is the kind of shaded area a lot of guys don't talk about. Like, oh, well, you qualify for elites. You got to get ready to put down $28,000 and, uh, get your deposit ready. And that's part where it sets in, you know, you got to come up with that much money for entry fees, dude, not including lodging and gas. And, and then you're fishing against those guys trying to get check. It's, you know, that, that, that's, you got to think about that as well, dude. And that's just qualifying is one thing, dude, but getting there and actually competing, it, it chews a lot of guys up and spits them out. There's no doubt about that. But with the new format, you know, nine opens, it's more, you know, people say, oh, it cut the working man out, you know. Well, I, I kind of agree with it, you know, because that's really preparing you for the Elite Series. You're fishing nine tournaments. It's like a trail. You're all in, and that's that's what you need to be focused on. I, I agree with that. I, I mean, at first I was like, man, that kind of sucks. I just wanted to fish one division, and if I had the chance, I would go. But – you know what I mean? It's there's a lot of things cutting the working man out. Um, besides, like you know, we're entering the worst economy since World War II. So let's not just say it's just the nine tournaments. <laughs> there's a lot of things <laughs> that going yeah. into that. And dude, I heard Jason Jason Christie say if he was like starting out like right now, like if he was to go back and to start out in the opens, he don't think he would do it just by how everything is right now. And hearing him say that, I was like, really? Well. You know? You you probably you probably know this better than I do, and I know the comments section eventually will, will will remind me if I'm wrong. But Christy, I believe, started out in in FLW, 
made yeah. his career just like Brent Ayler and then made the transition once he had that good sponsorship. And I remember that that used to be the thing where people got their start with FLW and you transition. Yeah. And now it's just, again, like there's so many people going out for the Bass Opens and you can't just make a living off of checks out of it. And I think we talked about that before we started yeah. recording yeah. here. And that's, and, and that's the thing too, but then it's so cool. I have so many people on the show and I ask them, well, do you want to fish Toyota or Bass? And it's like, ah, you know, I, I want to do the opens, but it's like, damn, that's hard. Oof, that's hard. Yeah, dude, it, it's, it's rough. So like I fished, I fished opens last year. I just fished one division, but I paid for the Southerns and the Northerns. I, I was supposed to fish Southern and Northern. I didn't get in the Southerns. I only got in the Northerns. So I was supposed to fish two divisions and I wasn't going to the Centrals. Jesus, it was Texas, Louisiana, and they were, you know, one of them was the Red River. I was like, I'm just going to do the Northerns and the Southerns. And the Southern schedule was good, and the Northern schedule was really good. And um, I just, um, you know, it's it's a big decision. And uh, I, I just, I don't think I want to do nine right now. I, I'm not saying I won't in the future, but as of right now with the young one in the house, Mama, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'll fish Toyota series stuff and I just, baby just came. So we're just kind of fishing BFLs, fishing BFLs, taking it cool. We're going to fish this regional on the home pond since we automatically qualified. We just got to pay the entries for the rest and we're there. We don't even have to show up. <laughs> and, and this kind of, this, this will dovetail into Smith because with that Norman tournament, you, you got to actually get up to the plate and you didn't strike out. You cracked a home run. And I really think when you have these big finishes in your life and it's not just fishing in any sport and you play up and you hold yourself there, it changes your brain chemistry, brain chemistry and how you compete. And when you go back to the BFLs and the teams, do you feel a little different in your confidence in yourself? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really confident, you know, and then fishing against those guys, you know, and then coming back and fishing here. Yes, it's still local talent. The guys are still going to catch them no matter what. But, dude, when you've been close so many times, like I've fished a lot of BFLs, and you, dude, I've got, I had before Smith Mountain, I have every trophy in the top five, but first place until oh, Smith. Oh, God. So, you know, it, dude, it was, it was a chip on my shoulder and it was aggravating me. And I know, I was like, gosh, I should have, and I've had the chance, man. And I should have won one of those things you know, six, six years ago, five, six years ago. And I just, you know, sometimes piecing it together, you know, it can be mental too. You know, you think, Oh, you got enough. You need to stay on the gas, you know? And we'll talk about that later, how I ended up winning by, I had 20 pounds in the box and dude, I was acting like I had eight pounds. So that's, I mean, you get 20 pounds in the box. You're like, dude, I got them, you know? And you, you can't think like that against those tournaments. That's how you get beat, man. If you you let off and you think you just got to keep your head down and keep grinding all day, and that's how you win tournaments, no matter who you're competing against or what you got in the box. Your first cast is most important as your last one, and that's a fact. Do you think it's harder to win a BFL one day, or is it harder to win, let's say, a Toyota or multi-day tournament? <sighs> Dude, that's that's tough. Because um, I, I, I really think, like, I understand like competition level and let's just put that aside. You have the ability to make adjustments. Whereas a BFL, it's just, it's, you gotta, you, you get one chance, you get one swing and you have to connect. There is no adjustments after that point. Dude, it's dude, like, you could talk to any pro angler and they'll tell you, dude, BFLs are so hard to win. And it is a fact, man. It, they are so hard to win. Mm -hmm. They don't give those fish trophies out very easy. You have to play. And, and you, you know, it's that that is they're hard. It's hard to win. It's all got to line up. And when you get those opportunities, you got to capitalize. And that's you know, fortunately, it, it worked out for me on Smith Mountain. What a cool place to win, too. By the way, I really enjoy fishing that place. And yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, we're going to get in, uh, we're going to get right into it then. Yeah, guys. So this is the Smith Mountain Lake tournament. This is the Shenandoah division. This was uh, April 15th. Um, you had 22, 14, second place had 22, 05. And I think there was like two or three, seven plus pounders brought over across the scale. It was, it, I, it was insane how well this lake turned out. And did you really think if you had to peg a lake that you were going to win your BFL, 
Would it have been Smith? No. Nah. I thought <laughs> I thought my first DFL win was going to come in the fall on Lake Norman. That's so fun how that works out. That's crazy. Like, I'm some- just being honest because – I've, I dude, I've done really well in super tournaments. I finished third regionals. I've top 10 open. I finished third top 10 in Toyota series that time of the year on Lake Norman, dude, I really chive with that lake. And I just always came up a little bit short. So I figured that was going to be the place where I finally knocked down that first win, but Smith mountain it was, and I, I enjoyed it. I'm not complaining about that at all. I, what an awesome fishery. It, it it really is the hidden gem of Virginia. And I and I wish in, in one side, I know a lot of my friends are like, I don't want to talk about this like at all, but it really is the gem of Virginia and it needs to get more praise for what it has. But I mean, you know, t- take us, take it away. Like what were your thoughts going into this tournament? You know, so I was fishing, <clears throat> excuse me. So I was fishing the division just strictly to qualify for the region. That was just a plan, you know, and with a young baby at the house, you know, I was like, well, I'm just going to show up, you know, and then I met some guys from Maryland. They're like, we got a nice lake house. We're going down Wednesday. So I actually went down Thursday midday. I got there about 3 o'clock. And as soon as I put my boat in the water, I looked beside the boat ramp. I put in up the lake, and there was a three-pounder on the bed. So the first thing I seen, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Up the lake, they're on the bed like this. This is going to be a slug fest, you know. I go on practicing. Start doing moving bait stuff and not really catching much, man. Like, why are these fish on the bed, but they're not reacting to buzz baits, trip, floating worms, uh, swimming a jig, um, mag drafts? You know, what they wouldn't, they, what, they were there, but they just follow stuff. But if you picked up a, a spinner rod with 10 pound braid, 10 pound fluorocarbon, wacky worm, shaky head, dude, that's, that's what they wanted. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. If, if you fish a lot of lakes around here, around North Carolina, they, they'll come off the bed, eat top water, floating worm. You can swim a jig, a chatter. They, they bite, but those fish, I don't know. It was just strange. It's like they wanted to stay low in the water column. They didn't want to rise up, you know. Hmm. Which, That's interesting. Yeah. So the first bite I had was under a shade tree on a wacky worm, and it was a five-and-a-half pounder <laughs> in, the black, in the Black River. I ran, I put in up the lake and that's just close to the house we stayed. I'm like, I don't have but a day and four hours, three hours of practice. I want to be on that lower end where that water's clear and get around them bed and fish. That was my plan. And I had a buddy say, check out the Black River. It's a good place to fish. He actually won a BFL in the Black River on Smith Mountain. I ran ran straight there. And I think I maybe caught five, six fish the, within three, four hours. So I put it on the trailer. One was a big one. And, you know, I looked and seen, like, these fish are full-fledged, up shallow, spawning, cruising. Like, it was the time to be at Smith Mountain Lake. You know what I mean? It was just mm-hmm. – they, they really did, dude. They hit the the hammer on the nail on picking that tournament at the right date at the right time. And I think the weather had the most to do with it, you know. Oh, I mean, how much is that about getting at the right time? And guys, we talked about this before we, we started recording about they went for the opens. I think it was September that you went to the upper bay. Yeah. Uh, the Toyota, it's September again for the title. I mean, it's just, it's a terrible time. And I, I know, I know it's the money, but it, it sucks because it doesn't show it off. The James River, they hit well a couple of times. And Smith, perfect. They nailed this. And Lake Murray for the Bassmasters, perfect timing here. And that's so important to show these lakes off. Yeah, yeah, I don't really understand the uh, Chesapeake Bay in the fall and the $25 a ramp day rant fee. Oh, I don't really understand yeah, that. And you have to pay the $25 rant fee a day during the tournament that you paid for. Uh, I don't really agree with that. I, I, will, I don't understand that at all. But they do give you a golf cart ride. I was going to say, I was gonna say <laughs> at least you get the golf cart ride for 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, do, they, do, they do give you the ride of your truck. And that guy sits there and just watches every move you make the whole time. <laughs> Dude's making bank, though. I will say that. For that Uber drive, man, he makes some bank. Yeah, dude. There's a lot of people putting in other places that they could. But, dude, oh, that's, my gosh. That was ridiculous. It, that really it, was. It, yeah, that, that it really is. Now, so after that practice and you got the tip, 
were you just committed to the Black River or were you thinking other thoughts going into the tournament? So I, I wanted to check it. My buddy, his name's uh, Kevin Chandler. He actually won a BFL, you know, in that area, you know, early on in the pre-spawn. And I'm like, well, you know, that's just a place to start, you know, just – that's not far from the lower end. I just checked it, you know, and I had some bites, you know, where I caught that five pounder. She was under a shade tree on a bed. And I was like, cool. It's the bite. There's some fish in the area. Let's expand on it. You know what I mean? That was, you know, just three day hour practice Thursday. And then I thought, I looked at my map. I'm really going to try to break it down as much as I can on Friday, which it was rainy, overcast, sunshine, thunderstorm, you know, during the day of practice on Friday. But, I did not completely commit. It was just a good place to start. You know, someone said, hey, you might want to check that. You know, and that happens all the time. Your buddies say, hey, check that creek. I've done good there in the past. And that's all it really was. And it was a good starting point, I should say. You know? How do you do that where you are able to process other information like that? Because we all have shared a house with friends. And that is the yeah. easiest way to get spun out is you start listening to them. And then that gets in your head. Do you just yes, say, sir. like, I'm going to give it an hour and then it's out of my head? You know, and he wasn't there at the tournament. And he just told me, hey, bub, you, you might want to check this creek, you know, the, the river. And uh, there's some big fish in that area. There's a lot of tournaments done really well in the Black River. It's no secret. I mean, dude, there was boats everywhere in there. And uh, I seen that and I was like, well, maybe I don't need to fish in here. And, um, it, it's, it, you know, information can spin you out, but you know, if closer friends, you know, and they're not there and they just say, Hey, you might want to check this, that can be helpful. You know, that cuts practice time short because Smith mountain's a pretty big place. It's not huge, but it's a lot to break down in a day in three, four hours. I mean, no doubt. Did you have a thought going into this about how you wanted to fish it? Like you said, a wacky worm under a tree. Is that kind of what you wanted to do? And is that what yeah, you ended so, up doing? So, you know, around here, Lake Norman, uh, all these Carolina lakes, we got boat docks, man. I, I told him, I said, dude, it's springtime. I plan on skipping a boat docks with a half ounce jig. That's what I wanted to do. And I had some bites on it in practice, you know, and, I, you know, as we get into my Friday, you know, that I'll talk more why I made that transition to show up with four spinner rods on the deck and not veer from it. First tournament I've ever started my life with a spinner rod in my hand. That's very Western of you. <laughs> you know, and, and I guess, you know, up north it's not a thing, but you're talking largemouth and less than five feet of water all over the bank and I'm starting with a spinner on my hand. I, you know, I I've, I've had this conversation at nauseum with my friends and, and guests I've had on the show routinely. And I just wonder how much of this Japanese Western influence is going to start. It's going to be more prevalent because I don't know how many people I've said like, well, I start skipping a jig. It's like, okay, so if 600 people are looking at that dock and skipping a jig, this is where that swim bait and that shaky head comes into play. And it's like, is the spinning rod just going to be more and more a primary thing we go to in tournaments in the future? I mean, so you obviously got less guys fishing shallow now. I mean, I've seen guys sure. fishing points on Smith Mountain. I'm like, why would you be out there? There's fish mm -hmm. all over the bank. Dude, I, I would believe 85% of the fish in that lake were on the bank when we were there. No doubt. Hands down. Dude, That's it insane. was... You can talk to, I don't know how many locals you talk to that fish the tournament, dude, but dude, there was a lot of fish shallow or either it was just everywhere cold wind that they were just there. So were you, were you your plan then to just mark as many beds as possible and then process of elimination on the tournament then? So I marked beds, I did, but I wanted to find areas that had, you know, bigger bed fish and fish where I can catch fish. And so like, if I went in there and there was a good one on a bed, I wanted to be able to just fish, not just go bed to bed to bed to bed. You know what I mean? And I, I picked, you know, two of the right creeks and there was big fish in there. I'm like, okay, I can just get in here, settle down. I got five bed fish marked. And if they're there, cool. If not, I'll just go fishing, you know, mm. you know, I did find the, uh, the winning fish on the bed. You know, it was it was a six pounder, but it was the decision that, probably won me the tournament first off start off the bat you know i marked three pounder three pounder uh a six pound female which i caught 
I, I had her – I swam her off on a spinner rod. In practice, I caught her in the tournament first thing. <laughs> now, and that is such a – that is something of a topic that's come up on the show a lot um, when it comes to sight fishing in a one-day tournament where – like what do you, do you go for your limit first? And then once you get to that, that good hour of 11 AM on when they really lock onto the beds and you hunt for them, or if you see a six pounder, you're like, screw it. I need to go to that fish first, just in case she's there. And that's my day is getting her first. Yeah. yeah so, so, so dude, dude around here, we're, we're big power fishermen, you know, and I, I fish, fish with Hank Sherry. We fish a lot of team tournaments. We, I think last year we fished some, you know, we won a few, but the year before we fished every Sunday together in a winter, winter time series on Lake Norman. So we, we power fish, man. We skip jigs, you know. That's what we do. And going into it, that's what I wanted to do. And, dude, they just wasn't that you couldn't power fish. You had to throw that spinner on. And going into the first day of the tournament, I knew, like, Cole, you don't – I put I put jig two jigs on the deck, and I'm like, Cole, you know what they're going to bite. That, that spinner on, when they're in that mindset, when they're worried about rubbing, spawning, suspending – Dude, you're not going to beat that wacky worm as far as no. the number of bites. And if you get around a big female, dude, she's going to bite it, you mm-hmm. know? And, and and then I figured out the shaky head was was the big deal, man. Like, when them fish were really close to the bed, dude, they, they, they could not stand that thing. thing. I, don't I don't know why on that lake, but they wanted the shaky head for sure around the bed. And I, I would venture to say... I would say eight of the ten, say I would see ten fish, eight of them I could catch on the second or third cast, if they, even if they wasn't on the bed with the shaky head. They were biting it. It was – dude, I went through like three packs of worms. That's insane. That's freaking insane. Like, I mean, so then when you figured this out, was there any other magic sauce when it came to boat positioning or distance between them? Because a lot of times I feel like young kids, when I talk to my high school anglers up here, you push the boat on top of them way too damn much. And I tell them you got to give them space. Yeah, you got to give them space and you want to be as stealthy as possible. You want you want to you don't want them to know that they're there. You're there. And so everybody's worried. This is this is the thing. I'm gonna give out some juice here. I actually learned in this tournament. You don't. You gotta pay attention, man. So, oh, I got a three pounder on the bed. Most guys are worried about just going straight to that three pound fish on the bed. But what they don't know is Big Mama's sitting underneath their boat, and they don't know. Mm. That's what won me the tournament. Is pay attention where the females were. That is a fact because. Everybody would look like they were running straight in the pockets, plucking the bed fish. And they'd pluck the fish and leave. And then females were sitting around, man. They were suspended around the docks. They were suspended in the coves. They were cruising around. And if you watched them, they would every once in a while, they'd go up around the bed. And if you could be stealth enough and put that worm right in front of her, the instincts in her mind would take over like, oh. My bed's right there. There's an easy meal right in front of my face, dude. And that's how I call them. That is that is the reason I won that tournament. That's 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 insane. Cause I, I know from like fishing a lot of blueback lakes in college, like fishing the gut of a creek in a cove is so important at certain times of the year. And I it's interesting because on lakes up here, I think we forget to just not just go straight to the bank and hit the bank in these small cuts and pockets, but to fish the gut where these bigger females are probably on. Yeah. And, and dude, the chances of you going in these pockets and stuff and just seeing a five, six pounder laid up there and two foot of water, it's just not, it's not real. It don't, it don't, you're not going to go everywhere and see that. Yes, you can. Sometimes they hide under shade trees and stuff, but it's just not, they, they're not stupid. They know, they know not to do that. You know, they're going to bed in that deeper, you know, and every once in a while you'll find, you know, a big female that's up there really shallow that you can catch. So how slow were you working an area before you'd make a move? I pretty much fished the uh, two creeks on the lower end. I think it was Craddock and uh, the other one, Witcher, I think. And uh, so I, I, after practice, what I'd seen, I was like, this is where I'm going to start after I found that big fish on the bed. And I would say I'd work it. The areas, dude, I didn't, I didn't do much running, dude. I don't even think I burned. I ran to the Black River to check that one spot where I caught that five pounder on Thursday. Other than that, dude, I soaked them areas. I fished the cuts, not just the big pockets, but like the small indentions on the creeks. Mm-hmm. Most of the guys weren't fishing that stuff. Hmm. And that 
that helped out. That actually helped me win the tournament at the end of the day, just fishing, you know, the cuts in the creeks, not the big pockets where all the two pounders are on the bed. Mm. Yeah, just that that little game within a game, so to speak. And like again, it's like the stuff that's not completely obvious. Yes. And starting with a shaky head and a wacky worm and not going with the power technique, which I think a lot of anglers probably did. Yes. And dude, I, I knew. I, I just it was in my head and you know, maybe maybe it was just a you know, a, um, you know, a, an experienced decision to know that these fish are not reacting. They're not going to change, man. There's too many fish up there worried about spawning. They're not worried about feeding. Most of these fish were biting to kill it to get away from their bed. You know, If you would swim a jig or, you know, throw a moving bait, they just fall it away and then they disappear. And it's like, hmm. But if you toss a wacky worm out there, you have to let it sit and go, Dunk, there he is. And it's like, you know, it was like, Cole, that's what you got to do, you know, and it's, I, I I don't mind catching them on spinner rod. <laughs> I am now a big fan of a spinner rod. Uh, Biggest so then, snack I've ever caught in a tournament. You know, come on, spinner rod, and I actually that's, won. That's freaking awesome. So then, like, yeah, let's talk about your spinning rod setup then. Um, and then, you know, a- any sponsors that you have with, with the equipment? Yeah, yeah. so I was throwing a, a seven-foot medium uh, Alba Garcia Vertos uh, PLX tournament rod, and I was throwing uh, Berkeley X9. 10 pound braid to a 10 pound liter fluorocarbon. And, um, that was my rod setup. And then I actually threw a, uh, a Berkeley max scent general as my wacky worm bait. Ooh. And then on my shaky head, same setup, same line size, the exact same rod, same kind of rod, same rod. You know, I just do a zoom, um, trick worm on a shaky head. I believe the shaky head was an eighth ounce. I'm looking at it. I actually got a pack of them sitting right there. What colors were you using? Green pumpkin. Simple. Both green pumpkin. No complicated. No. If you're going to say black, I'd be like, wait, that doesn't seem about right. Yeah. <laughs> we actually do catch them on black sometimes in clear water, you know, in the shade on the docks and stuff. But then it was green pumpkin. I was like, they're biting it. I'm not making this complicated. You know, sometimes, dude, the simplest things, you know, just keeping it simple can. And I think that's another thing that helped me. I, 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 I put my I put it all in on those 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 baits and I knew that I this is going to catch them. They might weigh fifteen, they might weigh twenty five. I just knew that if I did that all day, I feel like I, the odds were going to be in my favor. I just had to land the bites that I got, you know. And I, dude, you're not going to sit there and say, "Oh, I thought I was going to catch twenty three pounds," you know. May, I thought I was going to catch fifteen, sixteen, you know, maybe get a check, you know. But and then after you know, practice turn in the tournament and then practice into the tournament. My practice was paying off and like, dude, it don't always go that way. Mm-hmm. You know, you practice and you're like, oh, you find these fish, but everything I marked in practice worked out perfect in the tournament. You know, from two eighties, three pounder, three pounder, small mouse, you know, marked them and just catching them, dude. It was just that it was working, you know? So it then, I mean, let's get into like the mindset of the tournament the, your kicker did you find her in practice or was this something you found on game day so this this was this was the game time decision this is okay. this is the bowl of wax right here man this is the deal so i went into a cut and i found a three pounder it was actually in a cut with a marina and i had to go in around the marina and there was a three pounder on the bed on a walkway i flipped up there a few times she was aggressive and i was like cool there's there's a three pounder there, Mark. Boop, you know, kept fishing. Right around the other side of the marina dock, there was a two and three quarter pound buck, which I talked about in the interview, and then there was a six pound female, you know, just suspended around the outside of the oh bed. My God, I wow. flipped my shaky head over there, dude. That big female goes right up there, eats my shaky. I'm like, oh my God, why did you throw up there? I'm sitting here. I had her on, you know, I was swimming around the boat, you know, and then oh, just, that your gut. Oh, that sucks. So yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, Oh my God, let it go. You know, oh. let it go. And I was like, Phew. you know, that's one of them fish in practice that can either be like, you run to it and waste your time, you know, or, or maybe uh, this could be their spawn. And maybe, you know, when the buck, you know, you don't know what can happen on bad fish, man. The females can go in and, 35 minutes, drop their eggs and leave. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's the biggest fish I've seen since I've been here. You know, 
I marked some other two and three quarter, three pounders, three and a half pounders, but that was the biggest fish. Fished around, marked other beds, but at that night, the night before, I was like, you know, and then I thought it over the morning tournament. I'm going to run straight to where I seen that big fish. You know, straight. why? Why dude, mentally did you make that decision? I, dude, I just thought with with these fish, the weather not changing, the temperatures not changing. These fish are dedicated, and I don't see these fish going from spinning rod to ripping buzz baits out of your hand in one day. So I made the decision. I did not go straight to the six pounder. I started on the three pounder, which was right around the dock. So technically, I did start where the six pounder was, but I caught the three pounder. It was a three. It was three thirty or something. I caught her within like twenty five thirty flips. Put you controlled that spot. You 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 did the gamesmanship. If you were on the spot first, you were there. Yes, to keep boats yes, away too. yes. Okay. And there, yeah. there was other boats come there. You know, after it went down, and I'm like. Dude, if I'd have came, if I wouldn't have went here first, somebody else might have seen that fish. Mm-hmm. And maybe they did, maybe they didn't. You know, I caught the three pounder and I, I went right around the dock. And this is this is a, this is where the story just gets wild. There's a pontoon boat sitting there, and you can ask my co-winger. I have to look at his name on my phone. I don't remember. This guy in the pontoon boats got a four and a half pounder in his hand, like about to have a heart attack. He's like, Dude, I just started fishing. I don't fish much. This is the biggest bass I've ever caught. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, like, I probably would have caught that fish, you know, wacky worm, they're biting shaky head, wacky. I probably would have caught it. But I was like, dude, right on the other side of your boat, I marked a fish in practice. Do you care if I go over there and fish? He said, go on, go on, brother. Go ahead. You, you got it, dude. I'm tickled to catch this four-pounder, you know. And he, he went across the cove, kept on going. Well, I look, all I seen was the two and three quarter pound fish. She was locked on. First cast with the shaky head, I catch that fish on the bed. I put her in the box. I'm like, where's the where's the female? I don't I don't, I don't see her. Oh, there she comes. She went straight up around the bed. She didn't go straight to the bed, but I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna catch her again. I threw the shaky head up there to her, dude, and then she bit it and I caught the six pounder. So I started within oh. 25 minutes of the tournament, I had a three, three, about three, three and a quarter, a two, two and three quarter, and a six pounder within 25 minutes. I'm like, dang, dude, I got almost 11 pounds, 12 pounds on three fish right now. Like, this is, this is a good start. And I just picked the wacky worm up and started catching, shaky head. Every one I'd see one, I'd flip over to it, I'd catch them, I'd catch them, I'd catch them. Got to 15, 16 pounds by like 830. Like 16, 17 pounds by 8.30. I'm like, I got all day to catch them. I just got to get some big bites, you know. And, you know, I, I, I thought about pulling a mag draft out and doing dumps, mm-hmm. and I'm like, no, don't do it. Just keep the spinner rod in your hand. And I kept making those decisions. And I was going to be- the bed fish I marked in practice, dude, and some of them were deeper. And two, three casts, catch them, three pounder, two and three quarter, two and three quarter. And I just kept coiling up, coiling up. And I got around 19 pounds. This was another big time decision. I got around 19 pounds and I was like, I'm going to run to the Black River and check that where I caught that five pounder. Dumb decision, but you don't know that. It was was Thursday. I went there and it looks like they had, uh, the water had came up. So I couldn't even skip under the tree. And I was like, well, I fished around and she didn't come out and bite. And, um, I was running back, you know, to the creek that I fished in, and um, we put in, there's a ramp right there. It's in the mouth of the Black River, and there was a pocket I fished right before I put the boat on the trailer on Friday, and there was a lot of fish in there. And there was a three-pounder I caught in there. I, I caught her. It was a good coal. It put me over 20. And then I went back to that same creek where I caught the six, and I just settled in. I said, I know big fish are in this creek. I settled in, and dude, that was the decision that one minute. I just, I was like, I just got to keep my head down. I got, dude, I got almost twenty pounds, twenty pounds in the box. I just got to keep my head down, and dude, once you get to twenty pounds, it's pretty hard to call. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had a six pounder, and everything in the box was. I had a six, a three, and everything was like two and three quarter, and pretty nice. And I was like, I need some big fish, man, to call, and. uh I, I set up camp in that area, and dude, that was that was the plan, and that's how I spent the rest of my day. 
White what happened? Worms. You say what happened? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm fishing that creek. Let's let's talk about this too. So I had marked a fish on the bed. It, 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 there's just so many little stories inside this day that you would just love. I had a three. It was a three thirty on my scale. I had her marked, and she was in between two docks. I, I had to cast between a slip like that big with my line to get to her. Earlier that day, I caught this fish outside the mouth and had to throw it back. It was a 330. Mm. It would have been a very good call at the time. I had to throw it back, and I was like, cold, don't. Don't sit there and fool with this fish. Don't. It's, it's, it's swimming off. Don't just... Throw it back, move on, keep fishing. You're having a good day. Don't let your mind play these games on these bed fish. Went fishing. After I went and checked that fish in the Black River, I ran straight to that fish I caught outside the mouth. I caught her on a shaky head in the mouth, legally catch, caught her in the tongue, and she was bleeding out really bad. And I'm like, mm. damn. Like, the day's going great, but it's like, yeah, uh, it's, it's working on my patience, and I put some G juice on her. She straightened out right. You know, I ended up calling her, but she straightened out right. And I'm like, well, that's cool. That you know, caught that. Just went fishing, kept my head down, kept fishing, and uh, and do that. Then, then it got cool, man. It got really cool at that point because I knew the creek. I started fishing areas I didn't, I hadn't even seen. So after I ran the bed fish and stuff, I had I was like, they're in this creek. Let's just fish. And, dude, that was the deal. I started running in pockets. I catch, catch a three-pounder here, three-pounder there, and then uh, fish some other stuff. And uh, let's let's think about – because uh, I caught a five and a four later in the day that, that helped, the, that, the winning decisions. I caught one in the back of the pocket. I ran into a pocket, man, and I, I'm looking. You know, it's, at this point, I'm – I'm not going fast, but I'm paying very close attention to where these fish are on the bed, how deep they're sitting. Went straight to the back of the pocket, and I see a big white flash. And I'm like, well, you know, what, what is that, you know? It was a five-pounder on the bed in the back of the pocket. A white circle so big, anybody in the tournament that would have went in there would have seen her. But the whole trick about it was there was a dock that stood that, – almost to the other side of the cove. So you're, there was a lane just big enough for your boat to fit through, but mm. behind the clock, it was big enough to fit like five boats. You see what I'm saying? With so a, I, one light coming straight down, beaming on it. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And it's like, I guess nobody took the time. Because, you know, that place, that 150 boats, and then there was another tournament. There, there are boats everywhere, man. It wasn't like I was, you know, fishing secret territory. I just outfished the guys around me. And, dude, I threw a wacky worm up there, too, and I caught her, and it was a five-pounder. And uh, mm. that put me at 21, I think, 21 and some change. I was like, my corner was like, dude, that's the winning fish. I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I, I need, dude, I need to get to 23, you know, 22, 23. I, I might have a shot, but I, I think – 23 would cut the cake. That was my mm. – I was like, if anybody catches 23 by themselves, they're, they're going to win the tournament. You know, kept fishing, kept catching them, and I'm like, at this point in time, dude, I, I needed a big fish to cool. And uh, kept fishing, you know, and then I started venturing outside of the pockets and doing the indentions, and it was uh, – I was doing it 430. And uh, I checked a little indention where I had marked. I just marked it. It looked good. I didn't fish it in practice. I just marked it. I went over to it and just bang cast my wacky worm up under a walkway on a pier. Never cast that in practice. I catch a four and three quarter. So that put me at 22-14. And I was like, dude, I got almost 20. And my, my rap was scale. I don't even think I cleared it out. I got it right here in front of me. Just still got blood all over it and everything. My scale said twenty two ninety. Wow! Right there. That's awesome. It still smells like fish, and I was like, "Dude, I got almost twenty three. Maybe, maybe it's my day, you know." And I'm running around. I'm like, "Dude, they're just biting so good." And you know, 
I let out a lot. I, I didn't tell you every fish catch, but you know, dude, I caught 35 to 40 fish that day. It was like everywhere I Damn. went. Damn. I was catching them. I just didn't get the right bites. You know, I, dude, I was catching. I was going by two and three quarter pound fish, like not going to help, not going to help, not going to help. Like There is so much though to unpack there when it comes from just education of we are, we are, we are told agnosium. In every Bassmaster catalog I, li- I I read growing up that, okay, you're going to catch them in the wacky worm, but then, of course, once you get your limit, you need to switch to, for a kicker. You need to go to the mag draft. You need to go to that. And we overcomplicate it so much that if you're so dialed in with the damn wacky worm, why are you switching? Why do you leave fish? And that's such a simple decision that I think I am very guilty of that. I've made that mistake constantly in tournaments growing up. I, dude, I don't know what it is about that wacky worm. Like, dude, the, the shaky head thing was a surprise to me. Like, I actually had, like, an image in my mind and practice of, like, me fishing on a lake in between Lake Wiley and Lake Norman called Mountain Island Lake. And the guy in the back of my boat, I was trying to put, like, brush hogs and plastic baits in these beds, and he flipped a shaky head over there first second cast in the bed and catch him. I'm like, that gum, I mean, a shaky head's a pretty good bait in the bed, apparently. Dude, that was 10, 12 years ago when I before I ever even got in the big tournaments, and I, that was like – Let's try the shaky head some, you know. Let, let's let's try the shaky head and practice. And, dude, it tur- – but behold, you know, wacky worm, shaky head on the deck, you know, that – I just, dude, I don't – you got to think about it from a bass's mind too, man. Like, when they're up there around that, I don't know what it is, why they can't stand that wacky worm, man. I, I don't understand it, but they have, they have to eat it most of the time, you know. I mean – Think about any other time of the year other than when it gets really cold and they're on like Alabama rig or something. Like what – that's like the best bait all year round when they're on a pattern to catch mm-hmm. fish. I mean, do, do you agree with that? No, I, no, 100%. And, and I'm just thinking back though how many times that I would kick myself because you're on something like that and then – you're telling yourself that you have to switch to catch a kicker. You have to go to a big swim bait or a jig or something like that. When at nauseum, it's like, if you're so dialed into something like that, you don't have to switch baits. Just keep hunting. You're doing the right thing. It's okay to call through fish. You don't have to go into this Millican mindset of like, I'm just going to, I'm going to fish four hours for one bite. No, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, but again, I don't know why in my mindset you, you trick yourself sometimes and you do think like you probably pass your mind, I should switch to a mag draft or a jig now to get that kicker. You don't yeah. have to just keep doing that thing. You, you, you know, and, uh, I was guilty of it about three ish before I went and called mm-hmm. the five and the four at some, I pulled the mag draft out, made a few casts and I was like. I wasn't feeling it, dude. I'm like, Cole, dude, you, you, you've you caught a six-pounder doing this finesse spinning rod stuff, you know, and you're, you're catching them. you got 19 pounds. What, don't change it, dude. Just keep your head down. If you get around a big one, you're going to catch them, you know. And, dude, I had an opportunity to have an absolute monster bag that day. I didn't lose them. They just didn't get my bait good enough. I had two other four pounders and then one in between seven and 10 bite my wacky worm. And that is no exaggeration. And and that's something else too, is you didn't run a lot. And I know there are some guys that their pattern is to do the thrift thing and run a lot, but I really think there's something when you just sit in an area and get acclimated to it, things start to pop more. It's almost like when you're hunting and you sit in the woods long enough, things start to make sense because you're there so long. And I, that's almost like that Japanese vibe where these guys basically trolling motor past the boat ramp and they can finish in the top five. And when you were in this creek the whole day, and you started saying like, well, other things started to click. And it's like, well, if you're running all day long, to spot to spot you can't get that acclimated to an area where things start popping out and making sense yes and not having much experience on that lake that Mm. that kind of that's where that really keyed in so like at norman in the fall you know and stuff you know it's all right for the thrift approach you know running a lot of spots high percentage areas that you know are good that that makes sense because you know they're good areas you fished them your whole life you can pull up and do that but a time of the year when they're on the spawn and they're up shallow, you you pick a creek, and I happened to pick the right creek where the big ones were up, and I bro- dude I broke it down. You know, I broke it down. I was throwing the right baits. Um, it paid off for the victory. Just, just keeping the spinner rods in my hand and knowing like I'm doing the right thing. I'm getting the right bites. I just got to you know get around, 
and I made the right decisions. And that's that's how you win tournaments, man. Being confident in what you're doing and, you know, just going with the day, breaking down what's in front of you and fishing new water. I wasn't I wouldn't worried about the day before. Mm-hmm. Well, and now you have the coolest trophy case going from one all the way to 10. So that's, that's pretty awesome. I got, I got everyone in the top five in the BFL. So that, that's pretty cool. I think, you know, I, I hate that the other four are FLW, but they don't really matter. They're BFL. So, I mean, it, it'll always be a BFL. I don't care how many damn name changes and whoever buys the damn thing. It's still the BFLs. Like, I don't know. But like, I, Cole, I, thank you so much for coming on and telling your story because this was absolutely just fascinating—a deep dive about how you break down water and how you fish, if you fish efficiently in a new place. Um, is there any sponsors that we can give a shout out to specifically that yeah. helps you get here? Yeah, um, I, I don't have them on me right now, but uh, Hobie Eyewear was a big, big player. I was throwing, I was using the uh, Green Mirror lens, and uh, you know, my co angler was wearing a, a, another pair of sunglasses. I won't talk bad about them or anything, but. He's like, dude, you, you, those glasses are awesome. So uh, Hobie Eyewear, dude, they they paid off big time in that tournament because I think four of the five fish I weighed in, I watched them eat my bait. It too, that was special, especially wow. when you're talking big weight, you know, 22, 14, 23 pounds. That's that's some pretty big fish to see eat your bait. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Goodness gracious, dude. And then, like, what else do you have on your docket coming up? Like, now that you got this win, you got Norman in the fall. Is there anything in between there that you got? You know, I'll fish team tournaments and stuff around here, but just mainly the, uh, you know, the BFL. I'm, I'm probably going to do – I think I might do all of them. We'll see. You know, in the Shenandoah, I plan to go to Potomac next weekend and then the James River in June. And we'll see how we are from there. If we Maybe we got a chance to win the points. I, I don't think so because – I didn't do great at Kerr. We we might, but team tournaments and stuff, and then maybe next year or the year after that, we might be in some opens or some Toyota series. We'll have to see. Yeah. I last thing is Kerr the worst lake in the Carolinas that big tournaments are at because it's so every time that's brought up, people are like, ah, I don't really want to fish that place. There are few people that get passionate about fishing Kerr. Dude, and. That place has got fish, but dude, I don't know why. It seems like it's been on a downhill spiral the last few years. I mean, I remember going there way back years ago in the springtime. Dude, you'd catch them around the bushes and have a mm -hmm. blast. But, dude, I, it should not have been that tough for the first BFL there. Dude, it was, it was all, insane. I mean, dude, you could do whatever. It didn't matter. You wasn't catching much. It was, you know, I lost a few fish on a jerk bait, but I didn't have no practice. I just showed up. We just had the baby. <laughs> I, I just showed up. <laughs> just showed up, no practice. Me and my wife, my my baby, uh, baby Lane, uh, he was about three weeks old. So two weeks old, I, I was just glad to be there, get my points and move on. <laughs> it's probably there was a, there was a lot in my mind at that time. You know what I mean? Well, and, and that even amplifies this win, like to be able to, take all that noise and shut it off again. Like that's to win anything, especially a fishing tournament when you're by yourself in your head, it's so hard to do. And, you know, more props to you for this win. I think that just means there's, there's more good things to come. Yeah, man. I, I really appreciate you saying that about me. I, I've, I try to be humble, you know, sometimes I might get a little happy and come off cocky, but I don't mean it that way. You know, everybody gets a little excited when they win or, you know, have some good finishes, but I, I believe this is just the first, but there's going to be many more to come. I feel positive mm -hmm. about that. Just got to keep your head down and fish, man, and try to keep the positive momentum rolling in my favor. There's no doubt. My eyes are locked forward set on the regional on Lake Norman.
No, and that's going to be fun. And, and definitely we'll probably have to have you back on just kind of talk about your prep for that and what goes into that. But then again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about here tonight. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm. We might be talking, but we're done here. This is Fishing the DMV. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.